It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All the sports news you need every day in under 20 minutes. Follow Locked On Today, today on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Saturday to you. The Buffalo Bills defeated the Chicago Bears 41-15 to to improve to 2-0 and to start the 2021 preseason. And obviously, it was a really fun game seeing the Bills start the contest with four consecutive touchdown drives. Meanwhile, the Chicago Bears started out with three three and outs and a fumble that they lost. A dominant performance by the Buffalo Bills. So what I want to do here today is respond to this game. Talk about the big standouts offensively, defensively, and special teams. And my notes are overflowing. So let's get into my takeaways from the Buffalo Bills win over the Chicago Bears. We'll start with offense and obviously Mitchell Trubisky. Like I already mentioned, He started the game with four consecutive touchdown drives. The Bills scored 34 points in the first half with Trubisky at quarterback. Seven total drives, four touchdowns, two field goals, and a punt for Mitch Trubisky and the Bills offense. He finished the game 20 of 28, 221 yards, a touchdown pass, and a passer rating of 106.4. He looked terrific. He looked exactly how you want your backup quarterback to look. And you could see how much of an upgrade he is to Matt Barkley. But what I think I enjoyed most about Trubisky's performance on Saturday is that it came against the Chicago Bears, his former team that picked him number two overall. And obviously things didn't work out there. But just seeing how the Bills rallied around this guy. All week you can see... The Bills players kind of talking about this and tweeting about this, and you just got this sense that they were in it for Mitch. And then Mitch goes out and delivers an outstanding performance, and the discussion after the game from the players was about Mitch and how they rallied around him. And we're talking about a backup quarterback that is new to this football team, likely only part of the mix for one season. And you can see how he's acclimated himself to the Buffalo Bills culture and how that all works together where the coaches and players rally behind each other and everything matters, right? They knew that this was an important game for Trubisky to go back to Chicago and play well and everybody did their job to make sure that it was successful. That says a lot about the team. Now, for as good as Mitch Trubisky was at quarterback, the backup quarterback's Not so good this week. Davis Webb and Jake Fromm, who I thought did okay last week, both had some struggles. Webb had two fumbles. Jake Fromm took that awful sack that was nearly a safety on a third and long, just held the ball forever, got sacked, and barely got the football out of the end zone. And so with Trubisky not at quarterback and Webb and Fromm in at quarterback, the Bills had six total drives, three punts, two fumbles lost, And, of course, the kneel out to end the game. So you can see a very stark difference in the offensive output with Trubisky at the helm compared to Webb and Fromm. And, again, Webb and Fromm were reasonable against Detroit, but they did not look good at all against Chicago, which leads to a bigger discussion point that I don't fully want to get into right now, but I'll just say it. If Trubisky's a one-year guy, this backup quarterback thing is going to be another discussion that we have after this season because there is no answer at backup quarterback in my mind as it stands. So the Bills will have to find their Mitch Trubisky 2.0 next offseason. Let's now examine the wide receiver performances that stood out to me. Obviously, Isaiah McKenzie was a bright spot at receiver. Seven catches, 72 yards on eight targets. 
Thought he did a really good job of working the middle of the field, presenting himself to the quarterback. And there were times when things broke down and Mitch Trubisky was able to find McKinsey in space over the middle of the field. So a really good job of getting open, making himself available, and capitalizing when given the opportunity to catch the football. I thought Gabriel Davis did very well to uncover quickly and get himself in position to catch the football. You could see his size really show up and his his play strength to get in position to make catches where you know some of them were pretty tightly contested. So I, I thought that was good work for Gabriel Davis, especially when the Bills were wanting to incorporate a lot of the short passing game in this contest. And then I'll also mention Jake Kumro, who came away with a touchdown reception and had that really nice catch along the sideline that I think was a third down. So two really impressive catches. He did have five total targets, and I will say that on two of the three incompletions, I thought Kumro could have done a little bit better job of working back to the football, and he was kind of flat on some of his uh, his routes, and I wanted him to kind of bend things back towards the football to increase his separation and get himself in a little bit more of a favorable spot to make a play on the ball. So overall, it was a pretty mixed performance by Kumaro, but when you really come away with your most notable impressions of him being a touchdown catch and an impressive grab along the sidelines, I think you'll take that. How about the tight ends on Saturday afternoon? I thought the group collectively looked very, very good. Obviously, Dawson Knox did have a drop, but he also had a 10-yard catch on his two targets, so a drop and a 10-yard catch. Jacob Hollister played very well in the passing game. Three targets, three catches, 53 yards. You even saw Nate Becker come away with an impressive 14-yard reception. So for a position group that is not typically heavily involved in the passing game, the group had five catches on six targets for 74 yards. So a good game for the Bills' tight ends. I thought the Buffalo Bills' running backs were also a bright spot in this game. Devin Singletary had only two rushes, but came away with 21 yards, which included a 14-yard touchdown rush on a fourth and one. I thought on both rushes, he looked confident. He was decisive. He was elusive. You saw him slippery when taking on contact. I thought it was as good as you could want Devin Singletary to look, and he stacked together two really nice games so far. So I'm really optimistic about Singletary. To me, he's looking like the RB1 and the guy that at least gets the first opportunities to carry the football. We know that Singletary and Moss are going to get involved, but Singletary has really done well for himself through two preseason games as both a runner and receiver. Now, Zach Moss did play in this game, which was great to see after missing last week with a hamstring injury. He had four rushes for 21 yards, and he had some tough runs. I mean, you saw kind of that vintage Moss that you expect to see where You know, he's not super explosive to the hole, but once he gets there, he's decisive and he's powerful and he takes people with him. And, you know, he's just kind of this very dense bowling ball. And um, I think stylistically, he looked good, confident with the football in his hands. And um, that physicality that you want to see from a back of his stature really showed up. Now, as for Matt Breida, he was meh. I mean, You can tell that stylistically he's very different from Singletary and Moss. Doesn't have a lot of confidence carrying the football between the tackles. He's kind of looking for those side doors to escape through and really wants to use his speed. And so when it comes to Breida, I think he's just going to have to be used differently. You have to find ways to get him the football in space. He's kind of that satellite back where I don't really want to bang him between the tackles. I want to get him going where his speed can take over. And so that will be an asset to the Bills running back room. But I will say that I'm not completely sure that he's going to be a regular game day active player. Um, For games where they want to really utilize that speed, I think he'll have a role. But I wouldn't count on him as a player that doesn't really contribute on special teams to dress every week as the Bills RB3. I like that he brings something different to the table, but I just don't think he's a very natural runner, a pure runner in terms of 
being able to find space and really stringing together moves to maximize his quickness. Now, how about Reggie Gilliam, the Bills fullback? He wound up having eight rushes for 24 yards, which included two touchdowns, and his first five carries resulted in either a touchdown or a first down. So two touchdowns and three first downs on the first five carries that he had in the game. And obviously, it was a pretty significant role for Gilliam, who I even saw the Bills use him as a traditional lead-blocking fullback in addition to handing the ball to him several times in this game. And it makes me wonder, you know, is he going to have a role in this offense? Because Brian Dable said that if he is going to have a role, it would be up to him and how he fared in the preseason. Well, I think it's pretty impressive what he did today. And obviously, he's a major contributor to the special teams as well. And so if there's a player that really moved the needle for me today on Saturday watching this football game in terms of me thinking this is a player that I wasn't sure would make the roster to a player that I'm starting to think really has a chance, it's Reggie Gilliam. So I think there's going to be a lot of value in dressing him. And maybe that comes as the tight end three or the Bills only keep Knox and Hollister and Gilliam is this hybrid tight end fullback type player that can do a lot. I mean, he can carry the football. He can play teams, every phase of special teams, and catch the football a little bit while also playing tight end and fullback. I mean, the more you can do matters, right? And obviously Gilliam can do a lot. So I think he was definitely a needle mover for me today when it comes to my impression on him as a rosterable player. Now, on the bad side of things as it relates to the running back room, Christian Wade and Antonio Williams missed this game with an injury. And that's not ideal because they need these reps. I have a feeling that the Bills running backs that we saw on Saturday, Moss, Singletary, Breida, Taiwan Jones, that that's your four that make the roster. And with Wade and Williams not playing in this game, they couldn't do anything to change that. So unfortunate that they weren't able to go. And I do think that it impacts their chance to really make this roster. So hopefully Williams at least can get back for next week and we'll get a chance to see what he can do. But with Moss and Singletary looking really good and Brita providing that speed dynamic and how much the team loves Taiwan Jones for special teams, I don't think there's going to be a place for Wade or Williams on this final roster. Let's talk about this offensive line. And I know nothing can really compare to Trubisky as the story of this game, being the former number two pick for the Chicago Bears, not really making it as their franchise quarterback, coming to Buffalo as a backup, going back to Chicago, lighting them up, doing all the things that he did. No, Nothing's going to compare to that as the headline story from the game, but Spencer Brown was terrific. The Bills' third-round pick at offensive tackle. He was one of the primary players that I wanted to focus on in this game. And so it's not always easy to come away with great offensive line takes from just watching a game on television. You really need to watch the All-22 to understand who played well and who didn't. But my priority watching the Bills' offense on Saturday was focusing in on Spencer Brown. And so I was glued on him every single play that he was in the game. And he was terrific. In every facet of playing offensive line, whether that was blocking in space, where his athleticism really shined and that ability to stay under control and connect with moving targets in space, he did really, really well in that area. Then you also saw him create push in the run game and really wide in lanes. That's what I love about watching him play at tackle is when the Bills run outside zone and he can just take that that defensive end that's lined up outside of him and just wash him. He creates so much push and so much space and the Bills running backs when they are when they know that they have that offensive tackle that can really drive out and widen that defensive end who's trying to set the end and squeeze the gap down that's just going to be such a natural spot for them to you know put their foot in the dirt and and cut up the field and so he was really good in that and then also in pass protection that's where I thought he 
showed the most growth this week compared to last week where he was much more under control and he did a much better job of trusting his landmarks and pass protection and getting to his set points and staying under control and framing blocks on the perimeter and not getting too antsy and showing some patience, but getting his hands on guys. I mean, he had several reps against Khalil Mack, who's one of the premier defensive players in the NFL. And Spencer Brown did really well just trusting his footwork, trusting his base, trusting his anchor, getting his hands on him, and keeping him at bay. I mean, I thought Spencer Brown was really, really, really terrific in this game. And so last week we came out of the contest really concerned about the state of the offensive tackle position where Deion Dawkins was out with COVID and we had heard about how difficult it was him working back and you know, Daryl Williams is obviously good to go, but you're an injury away from Spencer Brown or or Bobby Hart, and those players kind of struggled in the game last week, and you had kind of heard about Spencer Brown being up and down. I come away with a very different perception of this offensive tackle group based on what we saw against Chicago, where Spencer Brown was terrific. I thought Tommy Doyle looked a lot more comfortable in this game. You saw Deion Dawkins play a couple of series, and I thought he looked good when he was on the field. So I thought the Bills' offensive tackles showed a lot of improvement week to week, which is really impressive. A lot of credit to the players and offensive line coach Bobby Johnson. Heck, even Bobby Hart didn't didn't struggle nearly as much as he did last week, which was positive. I thought Cody Ford played very well, and he was pretty good against Detroit. And so he stacked a couple of nice games together as well, particularly in the run game where he created a lot of push And then as far as the low lights go on the offensive line, I would say that Jordan Devy was pretty disappointing, especially because he's a veteran and he hasn't played a ton in the NFL, but he's been around for a long time. And he just didn't look like a guy that had much experience. You know, he he let some blocks get away from him. Thought he had some mental lapses in terms of protection and where he's supposed to be. So Jordan Devy, a guy that I think the team likes a little bit, but he underwhelmed me quite a bit watching him play and seeing him give up some pressure and you know just not being where he's supposed to be. But the story when it comes to this Bills offensive line is Spencer Brown and how good he looked coming out of this game. Did you know that Bilt Bar has so many delicious flavors? There is something for everyone. They have coconut, cherry, raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate, cookies and cream, orange, strawberry, and salted caramel. And look, there's so many great flavors, and maybe you don't know where to start. You can get a mixed box. That's where you'll get two of each of the nine flavors. You can try them all and go from there. And not only are Built Bars the best-tasting protein bar on the planet, they're healthy too. Check out these macros. 17 to 18 grams of protein. Their calories range from 130 to 180. There's only 4 to 5 grams of sugar and only 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. The flavors are amazing. They're all tasty, and they're all healthy. I've got a deal for you. Go to BuiltBar.com and use our promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. It's that time of year again and all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back to the gridiron to start the football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, and contests, including the half-million-dollar NFL Mega Contest and the $200,000 NFL Survivor Contest, both which are open now at Bet Online. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today, and you'll receive a 100% welcome bonus. Be sure to take advantage of their opening day super promo where you make a bet on the Thursday, September 9th season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and the Dallas Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports from football, basketball, boxing, right to horse racing. Don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, let's talk a little defense and special teams to close out the podcast today. How about those young defensive ends? Greg Rousseau, AJ Epinesa, they both were outstanding. Now, Groot, he showed up in the box score. He had a sack again, right? 
two games, two sacks. You love to see it. Had a tackle for loss. Had two quarterback hits. I mean, you can see it in the box score, and you can see him play really, really well. I love how he is winning. And it's not just as a pass rusher. You're seeing it as a run defender as well. I saw a couple of reps where the Bears attacked Rousseau's side of the line of scrimmage, and he set some really firm edges, squeezed down, fought pressure with pressure, maintained outside leverage, and spilled the run back inside. I mean, you saw him hold up extremely well in terms of functional strength at the point of attack, and that's something I had a little bit of concern about regarding Rousseau in year one, but he is quickly answering all of those questions. And then as a pass rusher, I just love that he's aware of what type of pass rusher he is, where you see him use his length, and you see him try to convert speed to power and takes good angles. I think that's something that's so impressive to me is he knows where the quarterback is and he takes good angles to get there. He doesn't get loopy or wide. He knows how to reduce angles, use his length, keep separation, unhinge, and finish. For a second consecutive game, Gregory Rousseau was absolutely terrific. And I thought Epinesa was outstanding as well. Now, his impact isn't measured nearly the same in terms of the box score. The box score will just tell you that he had one quarterback hit, but if you saw the way he was rushing the passer, it was really complimentary overall in terms of what was happening with how the Bills were rushing the passer, how it married the coverage on the back end, and uh, just the way he was winning as well. I mean, you saw the one rep where he completely steamrolled the Chicago Bears left tackle and was able to uh, affect that throw, but it was a consistent job by Epinesa to use his length and power to compress the pocket and really challenge the width. I thought he was outstanding, just like Greg Rousseau was. Now, as for Boogie Basham, I thought he played well, too. His run defense was something that I thought stood out. He was active and productive, came away with two tackles for loss, two quarterback hits, a sack, and he blocked that extra point. So he was active. He was effective. I like him so much more when he's attacking the B-gap. He's not a player that I think will consistently win around the outside hip of offensive tackles. But when you get him slanting and challenging on inside moves and rushing the B-gaps, that's where he makes the biggest impact. So I fully expect the Bills mean it when they say they want to use him inside and outside. Bam Johnson was terrific in the football game. He had a half sack, a pass breakup, two quarterback hits, and forced that fumble. Harrison Phillips got his hands up and broke up a pass on the first series of the game before he got hurt. You saw Justin Zimmer playing extremely hard, and that's what I love about Zim. His motor shines on tape. He doesn't win every rep, but my goodness, he competes to get to the football, something you love to see. Brandon Bryant had a good game. He had a sack and a half and two quarterback hits. Not really a player we talk about much, but there's a couple of injuries right now at defensive tackle, and maybe Bryant's a guy that can take advantage of some reps that exist. And then it was a quiet game for F.A. Obata. I don't think he played bad. He just didn't necessarily have the same type of impact of all the other players that we mentioned. So nothing to panic over when it comes to Obata, but Rousseau and Epinesa and Basham and Johnson and Phillips and Bryant, they were all so good and productive in this game. It's easy to look at Obata and say, well, what'd you do? He didn't play bad. He just didn't necessarily have the same impact as all those other players. I saw a stat from Cynthia Freudlin, and I'm sorry if I said her last name incorrectly, but she said that the Bills had a 57% pressure rate in the first half. That is an unreal number, an absolutely unreal number, 57% pressure rate. And that's consecutive games now where I thought the Bills' pass rush really showed up and affected the quarterback and never allowed them to become comfortable. And so you love to see that happen in back-to-back weeks. At linebacker, the first group on the field was Tyrell Adams and Tyler Medikavich, which I thought was interesting, a little bit of a shift from last week. 
Good to see Tyrell Adams getting some more reps, and I thought he played well. And then when Andre Smith got on the field later in the game, I thought he played well. So the Bills' reserve linebackers continue to look good. It was a bit more of a quiet game for Tyrell Dotson this time around, uh, but they're going to have a tough time sorting this out because between Medikevich and Adams and Smith and Dotson and Klein, you know, I'm not sure how many they're going to keep, but probably one of those two players I just mentioned are going to get cut. Now, let me say one thing about A.J. Klein. He's not injured, but he has not played in either preseason game. I think the Bills look at him as a safe roster lock and uh, pretty comfortable overall with knowing what they have and the role that he's going to fill for the team. Now, also, his contract is impossible to really get out of or do anything with, so yeah, he's going to make the team this year, and maybe it's just an understanding of that and not wanting to expose him unnecessarily, and obviously he's a guy that has a lot of snaps under his belt, but interesting to me that Klein's not even a player that gets in the mix during preseason. Now let's talk secondary, and I want to focus on Saran Neal to start the conversation. He made some nice plays in this game, whether it was special teams or on defense. But what everyone's talking about coming out of this game is the long touchdown reception that he gave up to Rodney Adams. And yeah, he gave up a long touchdown catch. There's no question about that. But my goodness, he was right there. He was glued to Adams. I mean, he was right in phase. It was a great play by Adams. I really don't have any criticism towards Neal on the play. He competed. He was in phase. He was right there. Adams made a really, really good play. I saw some criticism out there that Saran Neal needed to get his head around so he could make a play on the football, but I'm not sure that that's an accurate criticism to give him right now. A lot of times corners are coached to play the receiver's hands and not try to turn their head around and find the football because that just leads to more separation especially in that area of the field, in man coverage with no help over the top. I mean, if he looks back and tries to find that football, Adams probably gains a step or two of separation, catches the football in stride, and scores a 73-yard touchdown anyways. At least he made it a contested catch. So, again, I think in that scenario, he's probably taught to play the hands of the receiver and not try to work his head back around. Now, if it's a condensed area of the field where you have you know, the back line of the end zone to help you as an extra defender, yeah, get your head around and make a play on the ball. But I, I don't know that that's a fair criticism of him in that coverage technique in that area of the field. I think Rodney Adams just made a friggin' good play, and that's it. And there's not really any blame to give Saran Neal for what happened on that play. Now, I will say this, that collectively the Bills' young cornerbacks played a lot better this week compared to last. I was pretty down on those guys. I wanted them to show more in that Detroit game, and they wound up just giving up a bunch of plays and missing tackles and getting called for penalties. thought they looked a lot better this week. You saw positive reps from Elijah Griffin, Richard Wild Goose, Nick McLeod, who had an interception. So collectively, just a much better job this week by those players. And you love to see that. I mean, going back to what we talked about at offensive line, where Spencer Brown and Tommy Doyle played a lot better this week. Bobby Hart played a lot better this week. You apply the same thing to these young cornerbacks, and they all played a lot better this week. And so I love to see that growth, right? Week-to-week growth that you can see and feel by watching these players. And then at safety, I thought Josh Thomas and – Tamar Hamlin did a really good job in terms of playing downhill and being active and being around the football. So not that they made any impressive plays in the passing game, but they look confident and triggered downhill with uh, physicality, and I thought that was good, especially with Jaquan Johnson out and obviously Hyden Poyer not playing in this preseason game. Let's talk some special teams where I think there was some good things and some bad things. Tyler Bass was perfect. Two of two on field goals. Three for three on extra points. Kicking the ball pure and true. It's going right through the pipes. I mean, the guy looks like he's a star in the making at kicker. As for Matt Hawk, the Bills punter, he had four punts. Three I thought were below average, and two of those three were bad. Just bad punts. Didn't connect with the ball well. Shanked it. 
And I think this was the Matt Hawk that Miami Dolphins fans warned us about, where you get some really impressive kicks, had one good one against Chicago, was terrific last week against Detroit, but then some, you know, just bad contact with the ball. And so I I think he's just an inconsistent punter. So he quieted that fear last week, and he resurrected that fear this week. At returner, Marquez Stevenson, he was great, right? 26-yard kick return and a 79-yard punt return for a touchdown, which was obviously an impressive return by him, good vision, the speed was on display, and I thought the Bills blocking on that punt return was just terrific. Nobody on that Bears punt team was able to get a clean release, and so they jammed them up quick, never allowed them to get down the field, and it allowed Marquez Stevenson's ability to see the field and his speed to take over. So very impressive punt return for a touchdown by the Bills, not just by Stevenson, but on the entire punt return team. Isaiah McKenzie, he muffed the punt, and man, that was a a real low light in the game because that's been an issue for McKenzie. Going back to Georgia, his time with Denver and with the Bills is that he has some muffs. Now, he did have two really good returns, one that went for 35 yards and one that went for 16, but he's got to take care of the football, and that muff has me concerned. I want that to go away, and so far it hasn't. So I'll be holding my breath every single time the Bills force a team to punt, just wanting to make sure that the ball goes back to the Bills' offense. Now, I do like the potency of these returners. I mean, they certainly look like they are the types of guys that can take it the distance and create some explosive plays. But more than anything, I want to see good decisions and clean ball handling. So collectively, the special teams, outstanding when it comes to field goals, Outstanding when it comes to kick return. Some really big bright spots in the punt return game. The muff pump by McKinsey. And then we can't forget about the blocked extra point by Boogie Basham. So a lot of good things on special teams and some bad as well. The last thing I want to mention are the injuries coming out of this game. And obviously we'll cross our fingers on all of these. Coach McDermott really didn't offer any updates after the game. So this is what we know. Wide receiver Marquez Stevenson. He left the game with a foot-slash-ankle injury. X-rays were negative, but he did not finish. Offensive tackle Spencer Brown, he didn't finish the game with a knee injury. Offensive tackle Tommy Doyle, he didn't finish the game with a knee injury. Defensive tackle Harrison Phillips, he didn't finish the game with a knee injury. Defensive tackle Justin Zimmer, he had an elbow-slash-right arm injury but returned. And then cornerback Dane Jackson, he did not finish with a stinger. So... Stevenson, Brown, Doyle, Phillips, Jackson. All of those guys didn't finish. And so obviously we'll be staying tuned to what happens there. And hopefully none of them are serious and everyone's good to go and can practice all week and play next week. And there's nothing to be concerned about. But uh, until we get that information, I'll be a little bit worried about all of these, especially, you know, Spencer Brown, who was so good in this game. And I was so encouraged by his growth. I don't want there to be anything wrong with him. So I guess we'll uh, stay tuned when it comes to these injuries, but there's definitely several for us to be paying attention to. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us today here on the podcast. Another Buffalo Bills victory in the books and a lot of very impressive individual performances to go with it. As always, I kindly ask that you share, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast Have a great rest of your weekend, and I look forward to catching up with you again on Monday. The two top teams in baseball battle it out for 10 in a row. Here's what our local experts are locked on today. The New York Yankees won their 10th straight game, knocking off the red-hot Atlanta Braves 5-1 on Monday. The Yankees are still second to the Rays in the AL East, but for how long? Subscribe to Locked On Yankees on YouTube today to get Stacey Gautulius' take on one of the most competitive division races in the MLB. New England Patriots quarterback Cam Newton will miss at least three days of practice after traveling to a team-approved out-of-town medical appointment due to what the team is calling a, quote, misunderstanding about tests conducted away from NFL facilities. 
Could this open the door for rookie quarterback Mac Jones to get the starting job on week one? Listen to the Locked On Patriots podcast today to find out. On Locked On NHL, they are ranking the top 50 players heading into the NHL's 2021-2022 season. Subscribe to Locked On NHL on YouTube to watch or wherever you get podcasts to listen. Local experts on the biggest stories, it's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.